you knocked it out of the park. Your narration on it was incredible. Briefly making eye contact from left to right, Andropov knew he had their attention. In his native Russian tongue, he boldly stated, A saboteur assures me that the Americans will not find the problem until it's too late. It will either delay them significantly or doom them forever. What if they discover the damage? Alexei Kosygin, chairman of the Council of Ministers, what the English-speaking world referred to as the Premier of the Soviet Union, quickly asked. Before Andropov could answer, the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet, Nikolai Podgorny, asked, Will they know our hand in it? Andropov patted the air with his hands in a placating gesture. A man has damaged the valve. It will simply appear as if it had been overly stressed. Even the pessimistic first secretary, Leonid Brezhnev, scoffed. You expect us to believe your man could get close enough to the Saturn V rocket to cause fatal damage? As I understand it, security has been heavier than what the president receives. At this, Andropov cracked a dry smile. Not as an insult, but rather as a secret to divulge. He also noted the term, your man. If this mission failed, it was your man. Success would see the removal of the why. He would be... Ah, oh, man. Thomas Voltz, how are you? I'm all right. How are you? Very good. Now, where are you? Uh, I am in a uh, back room area. It used to be my little office, but my son's home from college, so he kind of takes it over. So it's a co-op right now. Great. And whereabouts in the USA? Uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, if you... Look where Chicago, Detroit, and Indianapolis are. Make a triangle. We're kind of dead center in that. In, okay. In well, I've been to, the... I've been to Chicago a couple of times. I've been to Detroit once. I've been to Minneapolis, but that's a bit farther further away, isn't it? Uh, Indianapolis. Uh, You're in Indianapolis, in, right? Yeah, I've been yeah, to Minnesota, yeah, but I've not been to yeah. Indianapolis in Indiana. I haven't yeah. been there. Yeah. yeah what kind of close to that? Isn't that where David Letterman's from? Uh, yeah, uh, Muncie, Ball State area. That's about 45 minutes to an hour from here. Okay. All right. So, yeah. And, and what yeah. kind of, what kind of town is it? What's it like? Um, it's kind of a mid-sized town. It, it feels more like a smaller town. It's the second largest city in Indiana. Um, but it's, uh, spread out enough that it feels still kind of small. I mean, the down, if you go downtown, it feels like a little bit bigger city. But if you stay in the suburbs, it's, you know, like living in a small town type of stuff. So it's kind of a nice mix of both. Yeah. And did you grow up there? Yes. So yeah. this is your hometown. So you know it inside yep. out. You know you know yep. what makes it tick. Yes. I and do. you're a firefighter. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that is a, a noble profession. Considering I read out loud for a living, I feel kind of inferior right now, <laughs> but I'm glad, you, I'm glad you're doing what you, you do. Have you, have you always done that? Uh, yeah, almost 27 years now. Oh, wow. Wow. So was that like straight out of school or college you went into firefighting? Yeah, I was uh, college, uh, kind of my major was uh, philosophy, which was kind of pre-law. And I thought, I just don't want to do that. And <laughs> At the time, my brother had just gotten on the police department right, about a year before. So I thought, well, maybe it's maybe I got a shot at this and tried out for yeah. the fire department and got in like right out right out of college. Wow. And have you been in many hairy situations? Uh, there's been a few. Yeah. yeah. And they they were yeah. fires or rescues because firefighters do all sorts, traffic accidents, yeah. everything, don't you? Uh, yeah. Actually, the traffic accidents are probably some of the riskiest. Especially why is, on the highway. Why is that? People don't slow down. They don't. They don't slow down and get over. And nowadays, few, people are paying less and less attention. So, it's it's pretty tight when cars pass eighty miles an hour, about two or three feet from you. Um, you kind of really have to watch your back out there. But uh, there's wow. been some fires where things have gotten 
gotten pretty close. Um, but wow. I, we're, we're a pretty safe department, very, uh, safety conscious. And we've, we've had some close calls because of unforeseen situations, but, uh, we're really, really good about protecting, you know, and keeping everything safe. So, so we haven't had too much. Yeah. Well, please stay safe and keep doing what you're doing. Um, Thank you. It's great to know that guys like like you are out there, literally putting your life on the line to save other people's lives. To you, total strangers most of the time. So just amazing. I can't believe people don't slow down at accidents yeah. like that. You know, because when we have when we have roadworks and construction here, it's uh, it's frustrating that they'll put speed restriction signs up on the weekend when, or, or they don't take them down on the weekend when there's nobody working in the roadway. So that's kind of the opposite of what you're talking about is like, I mean, it, there's nothing more obvious than when there's been a, a wreck and there's emergency services on scene yeah. for people to not think and slow down. I mean, how much of a hurry have you got to be in or how much of an idiot have you got to be? Yeah. yeah. We'll leave those unanswered. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. And do you think that being a firefighter has helped you with your other career as an author? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, well, the experiences of different situations, um, the biggest thing to me is the coworkers I'm around and the people we make runs on and runs with, uh, cause we run with the police department and, uh, paramedics a lot. Um, so just being around those all those different personalities, I will never run out of characters to put into into stories. Yeah, and that's got to make it easy because you can have the greatest story in the world, but if you don't attach good characters to that story, then there's no life in the story, is there? They are the life. Yeah. You, you need both. I mean, you can have great characters yeah. in a story that there's, but you know, the stories you, you're kind of more, in more of control of the characters. You've got to base them on some something real and yeah. have have you lifted any actual whole personalities of people you've met and made them characters in your books um no it's always kind of a cross uh, okay um, a lot of times like um i tend to be a bit of a smart ass as a lot of them a lot of firefighters are and uh so some of my books you will definitely see that come across um one that's being read right now um Dead Man's Touch, the main character is kind of like like me, but I would say on steroids as far as uh, <laughs> emotion. And I mean, it's over the top with a lot of the stuff. Um, very similar to like the Deadpool character um, yeah. in the in the movies. Um, just really always always making fun of stuff. And you know, for me, I, I I'll get jabs in here and there, but. But uh, this guy's over the top. So it was fun to write stuff like that. Because you've got to have people in a story just a little touch larger than life, haven't you? Than, yes. than in real life. Because you need, you haven't, the, the reader or the listener in the case of an audiobook, they're not going to spend as much time with them as they are with someone in, in real life, like the guys you work with, I'm guessing you've worked with them for many, many years. So yeah. you can just get your odd jab in here and over the course of time, people work you out and go, uh, we know what Thomas is like, he's a good guy and he's a good guy to have by your side when things go upside down. But yeah. in a book, you've really got to get that guy's personality or that girl's personality across as quickly as you can. So you've got to almost condense it, I'm guessing, to, to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's where kind of combining characteristics of different people I've worked with in the past and everything where I can use something from one or two different people, combine them into one character and, and make that, you know, push that forward. Um, but also the other thing, I, I always try to make flawed characters um, yeah. so that they there's always something they've either got to work on or something they're messing up and... Uh, makes them more human. Um, the very first book I tried to write, uh, when I had it edited, uh, the editor came back and said, you realize your main character, even though he's a college age guy is kind of like Superman. He hasn't made a single mistake in this entire book and went back through and rewrote it. 
turned out fantastic. I'm rewriting that again. Uh, that was the one that I was had talked to you about the uh, kind of uh, assassin, government assassin type of, uh, you know, when I get those done, I'll try to put those up for audio and would hope that you would be interested in reading those. Oh, I'd too. love to. I'd love to. If it's half as good as Saving Apollo, because this this book was terrific, and it was right down my alley, because I'm a bit of a space nut. I love, I grew up with the Apollo moonshots. You know, I yeah. was, I was uh, five years old, no, six years old when Armstrong walked on the moon, and I watched it live on TV. It was, in our time, it was like four o'clock in the morning, and uh, my, I remember my mother coming into my bedroom and waking me up, and she said, "They're on the moon." She said, come downstairs. Oh, wow. I th they think Armstrong's going to go out early. And I knew all the names and buzz, and I knew the difference between the command module and the lunar module and the whole thing from a very, yeah. very young age. I mean, I'm not I'm not a space geek, but I, I understand. I totally appreciate what, what an achievement it was in such a short space to time, you know, to, to fulfill Kennedy's vision and, and what he said in that speech. And, uh, yeah, so when I saw this one, I was like, oh, I hope we get this one. You know, I really hope we get this one. <laughs> And then the more I got into it and to see the story that you'd weaved around it, which was a story of a Cold War enemy. Well, let's, you know, let's, let's not mince words here. It was in the story of saving Apollo. And I don't want to give too much away, but well known that it was a space race at the time in, in 1969 for who was first on the moon. And the Russian rocket blew up on the launch pad and the Americans decided to to make to, to just really go into into high gear to get this thing done and the russian the way the russians would have felt but you take us in the book you take us to the kremlin and you take us to um discussions between and drop off and 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 various other uh, characters and uh and how they felt about it and they were not happy about it and then they they come up with a plan, and I don't want to say any too much more now. I'm going to back off right now, but they come up with a plan to make the the American achievement because they, you know, they couldn't do much about man landing on the moon, but they tried to really mess with it at a crucial time. So where did the idea? So there's a lot of fact in here mixed with a bit of fiction. So where did the idea come from for that kind of thing for that story? Um, originally I, I, I do a lot of, uh, I started off writing thrillers, um, and then went into trying to do some science fiction and some horror. And I thought, I kind of want to try a little bit of historical fiction. And originally it was just going to be like a five page story. Um, and I have trouble keeping anything short <laughs> when, I, when it comes to writing. Um, and the research that I started doing. I wanted to be able to tie that very last element that we had talked about um, in the book uh, with the names. Uh, I wanted to be able to tie that into something. And yeah, I don't. I don't want to say that, too much, but there are some. Yeah. There are some people in the book. There's some names in the book. Some specific names who are in a who are on a very famous memorial. Yes. And you've given, and no one really knows why, and so they whatever they did was secret, and to do with national security. So you put them in a position of doing something very secret yeah. in the uh, interest of national security, and you gave them roles, and they are real names. Uh, they're, yeah. they're real names. They're said to be mistakes on on that memorial. I like um, the story. Well, yeah, that's the, and <laughs> and I thought, okay, what can I tie them to? And looked around that time frame and thought, okay, maybe I can do something with the the. Apollo mission and I started researching that and saw how many things actually did happen. Yeah. And I thought maybe I could turn that into a little bit of sabotage, you know, and, um, you know, I was able to do that then. And I, and I thought, well, I'm going to keep going with it and get to the landing part and, and, you know, and splash down and everything. And then I had the idea for that part too. And I thought, when that when I read about you know the the wave that tipped over the cap capsule after yes, they landed, it, yeah. I, I wanted to give an explanation for that, and it it just it everything kind of snowballed into it, and I thought perfect. Here's my opportunity to to make something completely up, and it's it's grounded in fact, you know. 
So it was it was not a nice deviation from what I normally do. Now you say you made something up, but there is a chance that you know the truth and this book is actually fact, but you could not say <laughs> because it would put your life and the lives of your family in danger if it was true and you let out a <laughs> state secret. So, no. but yeah, ostensibly it's historical fiction. And, and what was great about it for me was because so much of it is the actual fact of the uh, Apollo 11 mission is, for instance, there's the part in there where Armstrong lands on the moon and, and says one small step for man, you know, the speech we all know and Tranquility Base here and all of those things. Because it's NASA, all of that audio is in the public domain. It's not copyright protected. Anybody can use it, just like all of the photographs that, that NASA takes are... You know, like the famous one, the Earth rise from Apollo 8 and the, the photographs of, of Buzz on the, the, the moon's surface and all that. Very famous photographs. They're not, they're not copyright protected. So you could do that the same with the audio. So when you got to that bit, I went and found the audio and put it in the audio book. Yeah, so, uh, great. when I heard that, I was like, oh, my God. He, <laughs> you know, at, at first I thought, man, he simulated that great. And then I, <laughs> then I started thinking, wait a minute, I bet he used the, the actual actual audio footage from that which to me makes this story even better you know it's yeah and, and you knocked you knocked it out of the park your narration on it was incredible oh um, thank you so, so much i'm glad you enjoyed you it yeah, well like it i said awesome. i i i just i with this it was like it was right down my alley this book it was just uh it was so much fun to do and then to be able to use the 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 actual audio from certain events even Nixon talking to the crew afterwards or what Nixon said afterwards after the, the crew were on the carrier. I actually got the audio of Nixon there and got that in there too. It was quite tricky actually because ACX, um, who we produced the, the book through, ACX, for anyone watching this that doesn't know, ACX is, is the, the branch of Amazon and Audible. Audible is owned by Amazon. Audible are the big deal in audiobooks, and ACX are the people who help put authors and narrators together to produce audiobooks. They have some very, very strict standards on the quality of the audio that you produce for an audiobook. And if it's too scratchy, or if there's a, what they call the noise floor, which is the noise between the, the noise of the silence, there's no real, you can't actually run silence if it's too quiet. It, it will fail the ACX test. And if it's too noisy, if there's too much background noise. And of course, these clips are off like, you know, you can imagine the signal that comes back from the moon. It's not pristine, it's, you know, from 1969. Yeah. So I had to tidy them up a little bit, but I couldn't completely take out all the noise or it would go silence. And, it would fa and I kept putting it through a filter that tests it. And I got it right on the line so it still sounded like because if you if you take if you clean it up too much as well, it doesn't sound real uh, as well. Yeah. So I got it just so it sounds real, but it's still it's still past all the noise floor requirements and some of the other requirements of the peak levels and stuff. So it was it was actually trickier to do than you might think. You can't just lift a, a, a thing. You think it's copyright free. You think you're halfway there. You're still going to make sure the audio is compliant with with Amazon and uh, Audible and ACX's standards. But yeah, I think it was worth it because it just gives it an extra yeah. dimension i think i've only ever done that once before in another audio book which had a quote from of all people donald trump and uh, i used a piece of a donald trump speech that was being quoted in the book but that was much easier because that was only from a few years ago and it was recorded in a an auditorium with really good microphones and whatever but armstrong on the moon was a microphone like this big inside his helmet you know it wasn't yeah. uh, so and and it was transmitted over uh, scratchy uh, low quality, you know, basically phone line uh, quality. Uh, so, but uh, we, we, I got away with it, and I was so glad I did, and it passed, and I was so excited. I told my wife about it. I said, "Yeah, I got that. I've even got the thing of Nixon when he gets on the." Thing. She's like, "Yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah." So, uh, yeah, but it is, it is a, it is a just a, a rip roaring tale, and it, the pace of the thing, it just marches along. You don't waste a second of the listener's time, or that for my case, the reader's time. Was that deliberate as well? Because a lot of people might have taken it at a, a much slower pace. You were just like hit the ground running from the very beginning. You start in the Kremlin and it's like boom, 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 boom. Away it goes. That That's kind of my writing style. I 
I like uh, authors like Tom Clancy, but to me, I don't like spending that much time learning about the terrorist eighth grade teacher and all that. You know, it's like I, I love some backstory, but to me, too much is too much. I just want to get in there and get them, you know, get the readers going and take them on a trip and get them away from reality for a little while. And the quicker I can pull them in, the better I can do that. And um, I just, I guess, uh, I like writing at a faster pace and, and keeping it moving. Uh, yeah, I think it worked particularly well for an audio book because that is doing it that way, starting with the story already in motion almost. Then the reader or the listener jumps in as the story, you know, it joins the, the story. It's not like it's the story gradually, you know, gains, but it's just like, bang, you're in the middle of the story. Here we go. Hang on. Here we go. Yeah. That, that really is a radio technique because my background is in broadcasting. I did nearly 30 years on live radio in the UK and Australia before I was an audiobook narrator. I've only been narrating audiobooks now about three years. But this is what I do full time now. But I used to be full time on the air every day in radio. And there's a very famous American consultant who's based in California, a guy called Dan O'Day. I've been to a lot of his seminars. And he once said, like, you know, when you watch a, a Hitchcock film, you might watch the opening scene of the film might be as um, a, a skyline of a city and then it will zoom in on like one particular building and then it will go to one particular window in the building and then the camera will go through the, into one particular room and then it will end up being a close up on, you know, somebody's hand or something. He said, you start miles away and you move in. He goes, that's a movie technique and that is absolutely the wrong way to do radio. When you do radio, which is a more personal one-to-one -one medium, you start in the room. And I always remembered that in, in radio. And whenever, you know, I worked for the BBC for a while and we did news stuff and whatever. And we, we would cover things like, you know, memorial services and stuff. And it's very tempting to go, well, here we are in the town centre. You know, you've got to start, you know, start on the name on a wreath, you know, a wreath of, 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 of just one person's, you know, message to somebody they lost in service or something start with that and then move out and it's much more powerful and that's yeah. exactly what you did and i don't know whether you were thinking audiobook at the time but it definitely works really well as a technique for audio which if anyone is uh, watching this who is an author and is thinking about writing for audio that is a good thing to remember is do the opposite of hitchcock yeah so did you know any of that going in uh, no, I and I originally never imagined any of my stuff on audio. You didn't? Audio Why format. not? No, because uh, I was just writing and hoping to get picked up by an agent somewhere and just story after story, just trying to get, get things out there. And, you know, now that I've heard some of my stuff on audio, it's, it's to me, it makes me feel better as a writer. You know, and yeah. listening to my own stuff, listening to somebody else read it, I'm like, man, this this is pretty good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, you know, and with all the voice inflections and and uh, all that, it's like, this is exactly what I want now, you know, I'm, and I I can't get enough of it, you know, I'm like, all right, I'm gonna write more stories and I'm gonna keep trying to put things on there to get get auditions and get things out there. Um, so yeah, it's it's been really nice. I have uh, another one that's in review, and then uh, the longer novel is just finishing up right now and getting ready to go to review. Um, so that'll be that's been it's been great listening to all of them. I I, I found some incredible narrators on there. Oh, you I'm know. so glad. And like I said, I I, I want to have one a narrator for each series. So that, yeah. you know, somebody to stick through for the full series. And, and I yeah. kind of wanted a different voice for each one, yeah. you know? So that's why, you know, when I heard you on this audition, I'm like, I, I got to get him for one, <laughs> one of my other series. So, <laughs> so what was it originally there? You know, you know, obviously you've been, you're writing. So words and creating things for a reader has been, what was it that first made you go, you know what, I'm going to try and have a go at a few of these and see how they work as audiobooks. What What was it that pushed you over the edge? Um, I started listening to more audiobooks. You and, did? Um, yep. And I thought, oh, maybe I can give it a shot. And originally I just took three of my 
uh, not the shortest stories, but short stories and, and put them on there like a uh, couple of novellas. And this one, I think, would technically be considered a novelette because it's too long to be a short story. But, uh, yeah, you know, I thought I'm going to put these on there and see what happens and, and how I like it. And, you know, once I, I believe you were the very first audition of, of the three that I put on there. Yours yeah. for Saving Apollo was the very first edition. I listened to that and I was like, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm in for the long haul now. Um, and <laughs> listen, listened to quite a few others and I was like, yep, this is one I want. This guy's one I want. And, you know, so it was, it was definitely interesting, you know, hearing all these new voices. So. It was interesting with your audition because I, th if I remember rightly, in, you know, when, when, you, when you put stuff up for audition, you put a few guidelines, and one of the guidelines is what kind of accent you would like the book um, read in. And I've done books in all sorts of accents. I've done books, a whole book where I'm Scottish. The History of Scotland I did uh, as a Scotsman all the way through, and I'm not Scottish. I've done, you know, books as an American. I've done books as an Australian. I've done books as an Irishman. I've, you know, I've done a few. I, you know, I like to have a bash at... at most things, especially if they, it's slightly out of my comfort zone. But your one specifically asked for an American accent. And I looked at it and there were a lot of accents in there because there's Russians, obviously. And then there's a lot of the, most of the characters are Americans. And I thought the best way to do this, to differentiate it is to have, to, to me, when I read it on the page, I thought this would work best if I just did my normal kind of British accent, but then do American characters as as the character so you can tell who's which bit's narration and which bit which bit is a character and i want that wanted the listener to make that clear differentiation but yours actually spe specified it wanted an american accent for the um for for the narration and i thought i think my idea is better i'm just going to try it and if i don't get it i don't get it because i think this is how it will work but i took a punt with yours and uh didn't know but i think i i think i gambled and won on that one didn't i Oh yeah. Yeah. And it was a great suggestion. Um, you know, I, with the, the setup on it, I have to select, I think it's five different categories and one of them is, is accent. I think I put American general just, yeah. you know, figuring I just want, you know, I it's never an American story. Like, I can yeah, see that. And I never yeah. considered a British accent for any of my stuff, but yeah. Um, actually I think three of the narrators that I'm using are, english uh british <laughs> you know so it's like i like that accent better so let's go that way <laughs> oh well yeah well um oh, oh, it was fun to do so so how long have you been writing now then um i started i want to say it's been close to 20 years ago just wow. doing it as a hobby uh, yeah on a dare <laughs> yeah um who yeah, dared you I, what happened my wife, I watched, uh, I caught a bit of the Born Identity on the movie, um, the scene in the diner where he explains, you know, I can tell you all the license plates, the vehicles out front, I can, you know, and, and he rattle, rattles off all this stuff. And he said, how can I know that, not who, know who I am? And I thought, I'm going to watch the whole movie. So I, find, I came home, I caught that at work and I came home and pulled it up, watched the whole movie and thought, I really like that movie. I want to read the book, which I wasn't a big reader at the time. So I read the book and they're totally different. Like in the book, Jason Bourne's character is, I think in his fifties to start the book, you know, and, um, it's set in the time of Carlos, the Jackal and all that. So there, there are so many differences. And I, I was talking to my wife about it and I'm like, I kind of like the younger lead character and this and that and going through stuff. She finally got sick of me talking about it. She said, why don't you shut up and write, write your own damn book? And I thought, all right, I'll show you. Um, about two months later, I had the first draft done, um, which afterwards, you know, looking into it, I found out that's like incredible time, you know, to finish something. So it was, you know, it was an experience. And then I, I had it professionally edited and found a lot of mistakes. And I was able to speed up the pace of my writing, learned from that, um, and then, you know, kept writing. Uh, I started writing a follow-up book to that one. Thought about a different character I wanted to do. So I did something totally different. 
And then every time I come up with new characters, I'm like, I want to keep the, that story going. And then while, while I'm doing that, I think of something totally different. So I've got I actually have, I believe it's eight or nine series of different characters going that um, only two of those will cross over with each other. Everything else is completely different, shut off from, from all the other series. So it's, you know, like I, there's one story that I did that's like a uh, Star Wars type of space opera. Um, and finished that and thought, I'm going to keep going with that. But I got these other things and I, I currently have like eight projects in progress right now that I have multiple chapters done. So I, whatever my mood is for the day, I'll go work on that one. And then hopefully I'll, I'll finish them like one after another, after another. So hopefully I have like a big market flood with like six, seven books coming out within three months of each other, things like that. But Wow. Um, right now it's, you know, I'm just hitting certain ones trying to get, get ready. I have a couple of uh, conventions where I'm going to be doing some uh, book signings and things yeah. like that. So I'd, I'd like to get one or two more done before those. Um, so kind of crunching it and I have to focus on one, one or two right now and leave the other ones sit for a bit. And I hate doing that. So but, it's yeah, great, it, isn't it's, it? Yeah, it, it spiraled into something completely different. I just thought, oh, I'll just do this on the side. Now I want to do this as a career. You know, yeah. I want this to be what I do for a living. Um, yeah. I know, you know, the fire department takes its toll physically on you and you can't do it forever. And I kind of yeah. think, you know, if I could flow right over into something new, that'd be perfect. You know, um, it yeah. would make retirement there'd be no like oh i miss doing that i'll miss it but i'll have something else to focus on and all that and uh, i think that'll that'll keep me going pretty good but i'm going to keep doing it whether whether people buy the books or not i'm going to keep putting them out there so i think they'll be buying them and you, you said how you're working on multiple books at a time mm -hmm. Do you have to be disciplined and, you know, because I've spoken to a lot of authors and some of them force themselves to write a certain amount of words per day. Do you do that or do you, do you have to really be in the mood for the right mood for the right book? I, I try to, but again, it's, it's all about mood. I'm very easily distracted too. So if I get on a, a kick of, of watching certain videos, you know, it's like, all right, I need to sit down and, um, I mean, there's days like last night, I think I did five pages. Um, and it wasn't until I finally focused enough that I probably did four of those pages in an hour, but I was sitting yeah. in front of my computer for about four hours, you know, checking different things, looking at all these other, you know, messing around with stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm always looking at stuff. I just had my website redone. So it's up and, um, that's the old one was just really basic. This new one, you can the new actually, one looks nice. It looks yeah. nice. Thomas yeah, Vaults books.com. Thomas Vaults books.com. Um, yeah. check that out. There'll be, there'll be, if you're watching this on YouTube, there'll be a link in the description to Thomas Vaults books.com. It's a very, very classy uh, website, and all the books are there, and you can click on them and buy them direct through yep. the site and everything. It's nice. It's a really, yeah. Really nice. And you sent me a message, I think it was last week or the week before, you were saying you were having it redone. And so this morning I thought, oh, I wonder if he's got it all in shape. And I looked at it this morning and I'm like, that's a nice website. It's classy. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, well done. Did that take a lot of communicating to the web people, whoever it was that did it? Was that tricky? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and of course, part of it, too, is I wanted, you know, so much stuff in there and it, it would have. I, there's a lot of things in there, like the coming soon books, like in different series. Um, yeah. And I, I probably spent a little too much time trying to get some of that in there. It's, you know, I should have just focused on what's available right now. Maybe do one or two of those coming soon, because I think I have six or seven of those, the projects I'm working on right now. So I'm, uh, you know, I, I found myself getting, I, I tend to get wrapped up in distraction. And for me, that was a great distraction. Um, so yeah, that's... I know exactly what you mean. I mean, my website, I do that myself. I just use a Google Sites, a free thing. I don't spend any money at all on it, but I put a lot of time into it. And I find that 
it's a real rabbit hole you can go down you go oh, i want to change that and i see something someone else has got on a site and i think oh i want to have that too and i try, try and work out how to get that going and so i've just got it down really basic now but every morning i do or i just have a routine first thing in the morning i do something on twitter about on this day and it might be on this day you know there's a piece of audio from somebody i interviewed on the radio or on this day what was today on this day it's the birthday of the barcode uh, the first barcode in 1974, it was a supermarket in Ohio to buy a packet of chewing gum. And it reminded me of uh, a Bill Burr, comedian Bill Burr did a bit mm-hmm. about uh, about when you can, now you can scan the barcode yourself and you're in a grocery store, you, you're you the one that, whatever, and he did a bit of that. So I linked to a bit of that piece of comedy, but it's based on it. The, the peg that I hang it on is, it was on this day. So I do that first. And then the next thing I do is I look at my website and I kind of limit myself to no more than about 20 minutes of, you know, if there's anything I want to change on there. And if it gets to about 20 minutes and I've, you know, haven't already, I, I get off that. And then the next thing I do is I go on Audible. But the order, first thing I do on Audible is to see if I've had another audiobook released. And then as soon as one's released and it's like, it's been running at about one to two a week lately. I suddenly go, oh, I've got to get that on the website. And then I go back into the website and then I'm back <laughs> into it again. And then by yeah. the time I've, I've emailed the author saying, look, I've just put the book up on my website and, hey, would you like to do a YouTube chat for the website and, and all the rest of it? And then, and then I just have to, I have to then leave it and not go back for the rest of the day. I do it like first thing and I'm going to get it out of my system after I've done that on this day thing. The next thing I do is the website and then the next thing is Audible, which usually brings me back to the website. But then I have to discipline myself to like leave it alone or I'll just be on it all day because yeah. you, you, I know exactly what you mean because you because yeah. it is your you, you it's your, like your shop window isn't it into what you do yeah. uh, and you want to come across the best you can so I and, but thomasvoltsbooks.com link in the description if you're watching this on YouTube uh, check it out it really is a really nice website it's really well put together so what's next for Thomas Vaults uh, hopefully finishing up a couple of these projects that I got um, I Probably the next announcement will be the uh, Solaria, uh, my time travel science fiction uh, novella, should be up on on Audible here mm-hmm. within a few days. Um, yeah, so that that should be the next main announcement. Um, but uh, you know, right now I'm, I got to try to focus on getting a couple of these books knocked out so I can get them ready for, you know, so I can have some new product out there great uh, yeah right. so i'm i'm just going to keep trying to go I'm, I'm just getting started with all these social media with um twitter and uh instagram trying to follow the, you know other people trying to get more followers and then i i don't even know if i've made a single post yet you know so oh, I that's another minefield that. i mean I I resisted as long as i could i resisted facebook and i'm still i'm on it somewhere uh and and Julie, my wife, she she puts things on there, but I stay away from that because I know I just get obsessed with that one. She loves um, Instagram. I stayed away from that, although I'm on there somewhere as well. I just decided, look, I'm just going to pick one, and I don't know whether I've picked the right one or not. But now I I just do Twitter, and I love Twitter, and uh, that's just the one I do. But I but from what I hear, particularly from authors is the big one, the one that you've got to get right is Facebook. So maybe I should be doing more there, but I just can't, I, I don't know. Yeah. But if you can get Facebook right and get Facebook marketing right, supposedly it's a it's a really, really good tool for selling books, uh, audio and, and uh, e-books and print books. Yeah. So I don't know, but it is hard because it's keeping up. And, you, and my worry is I could get right into it and then, the next thing comes along because what happened to MySpace? You know, it, yeah. it, it could, and you could just get, you get stuck in. Because I like to go, maybe it's just me, I like to go deep rather than wide. I'd like, like to go deep into Twitter rather than wide and just into lots of the other ones. And I think that's, I don't know, maybe that's just how I am, but uh, hey, that's it. But apparently Facebook is the one that's, that gets the traction because it's the big one. It's what everybody's on, yeah. except me. Um, <laughs> yeah. Saving Apollo is the book. It is historical fiction. It's you don't have to be a fan of the the space race and, and the moonshots and Apollo and everything. It helps if you are. 
but you don't have to be because this is a basic story of good versus evil and also a story, a, a Cold War story, which the Cold War is a gift that just keeps on giving. You know, they didn't yeah. make all those James Bond films and, you know, how many movies have been made about, you know, set in the Cold oh, War. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just great. And so it's got that element to it and the espionage and the the, the politics, but also the the you know man's greatest adventure man's greatest achievement to put a man on the moon it's got that story woven into it as well and i think the audiobook it's really only it's 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 in and out it's under three hours isn't it in in audio terms it's like like i say it's a fast-paced thing yeah. and it, it doesn't mess around it's like bang it's uh, it's in there it, it in fact if you haven't experienced the work of thomas Voltz yet and you want to get into it um saving apollo would i think would be a good place to start but uh, hey you can start wherever you like um, it, yeah. it's up to you check out the books of Thomas Waltz check out the audio book of Saving Apollo there will also be a link to Amazon in the description if you're watching this on YouTube and Thomas Waltz it's been great talking to you and meeting you at yeah. last yeah, uh, and you're a great meeting you you're also a genuine hero. For goodness sake, you're a firefighter. <laughs> you know, I spent 29 years telling fart jokes on the radio. I've got nothing to be proud of. Oh, man, <laughs> I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but now I'm rubbing shoulders with uh, world-famous authors who also happen to be heroes in their community. So it's all good. Thomas Fultz, thank you. Thank you.